Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us from all over the world for our event, Pioneers, Iranian Americans in Science Today. My name is Negar Siari. I'm a PhD candidate in linguistics at Georgetown University and a teaching assistant in the Persian Studies program at Georgetown. If at any time you'd like to pose a question, please use the Q&A box so that we may address that question during our designated Q&A portion. As always, questions are welcome in English, Finglish, and Persian. Now I have the pleasure of introducing the founder and director of the Persian Studies program at Georgetown University, Professor Farima Mostofi. Aloha, Hayan. Salam, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Persian Studies program of Georgetown University, I would like to welcome you to Pioneers, Iranian Americans in Science Today, our seventh Jolinos lecture series in the form of a webinar. We truly appreciate your presence today and your interest in our cultural events. We are planning uh, to have one more event this year in November that you will receive uh, soon the information. Let me also extend my gratitude to the Jolinos family that without their help, these cultural events would not have taken place. I now have a pleasure of introducing you our panelists, Dr. Mona Jarrahi, Dr. Pardi Sabeti, and our moderator, Mr. Romtin Arablui. I turn it over to you, Mr. Arablui. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, for our English audience, uh, really interest, we're really, I'm, I'm excited that people have this much interest uh, in Persian studies. Um, I'm often in a bubble in my job and don't get a sense of it. So um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ramtin Arablui. I'm a uh, co-host and co-producer of an NPR podcast and radio show called Throughline. It's a history show. Um, I've been doing it for a couple of years, uh, and I've been in the field of journalism for, for, for many more. Um, I'm also a musician, so, and we'll get to that, I think, in our, in our conversation today. What we want to try to do today is talk to these two esteemed guests we have here, um, two folks who have been recognized for their work in science, um, two Iranian-American women, um, that we want to, you know, really have a conversation about how they got into this field, what the challenges have been, um, both uh, in their identity as women, but also as Iranians, um, and what the benefits of those identities have been in terms of their work and what their hopes are for the future of this work. So uh, I'm going to introduce both of them, and then we're going to just jump right into the conversation. First, um, I want to introduce um, Dr. Mona Jarrahi. Uh, 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 Mona is an electrical and computer engineer and director of the Terahertz Electronics Laboratory University at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles. I think someone uh, just needs to be in mute there. That was, this might be you, Charlie. You wouldn't mind, thank you so much. Um, uh, Professor Jadra, he has made significant, con significant contributions to the development of ultra-fast electronic and optoelectronic devices and integrated systems for terahertz, infrared and millimeter wave sensing, imaging, and co computing communication systems. As far as the things that I've read around this, this really has to do with computing speed, and she'll talk a little bit more about that. She's been recognized uh, as the Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Research Award from Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Uh, more, the Moore Inventor Fellowship from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Kavli Fellowship from the USA National Academy of Sciences, the Granger Foundation Frontiers Award from the US National Academy of Engineering. Mona got her BS degree in electrical engineering from Sharif University of Technology in 2000. Uh, that is a Iran's top techno technology university and science university, which we'll talk about and her MS and PhD degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University. She served as a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, and now is a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome. Uh, the, our other panelist is Dr. Paddy Sabet, who's a professor at Harvard University and the Broad Institute of Harvard University, MIT, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She's a comp computational geneticist, uh, my, my old job. She's contributed to human microbial genomics, information theory, 
and rural infectious disease surveillance and education efforts in West Africa. She was named Time Magazine's per, among Time Magazine's Persons of the Year as an Ebola fighter and 100 most influential people in the world. She's the host of Against All Odds and lead singer of the rock band Thousand Days. She got her BS at MIT and was a Rhodes Scholar and studied at Oxford University. So welcome, both of you. Thank you for being here. Um, Happy to be here, Sekhari. Of course. So I want to start um, with the, the, I think the most, uh, the basic, you know, you can hear somebody's bio, but a bio isn't going to tell you kind of what's in the, what that person's passion is or the soul of that person's journey or how they got to where they are today. Um, I'll start with with you, Patty, and then we'll also go to we'll go next to you, uh, Mona. Patty, what what was the first kind of moment uh, for you as a child where you realized that you had an interest in 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 math and science, and where did that journey begin for you, like geographically? Where did you grow up, and and how did that yeah. journey begin? Well, I mean, you know, it's funny. I have a terrible memory for my childhood, so it's uh, like uh, I have no okay. idea. I think I my first uh, memory is somewhere around ten years old, but I do. I think it's as long as I can remember. I just remember mm -hmm. liking math. I just math was always and I like doing math puzzles. I was just like obsessed with math. Like when we did addition, multiplication, times table, I got I became obsessed and I tried to do them faster, better, try to figure out new tricks of doing it. So. For me, like it's just that was like there's certain things that are just innate. Um, math was always innate. I just I love data um, of all kinds, and I always liked nature as well. And so I think and and the field I'm in, if I was to look at it later, is uh, genetics, which is nature as mathematical information. It really is take, looking at the whole world around us and looking at these um, different. Um, letters that, that make it up this code that makes it up that you're deciphering and trying to understand how nature could work so I essentially I, I'm getting to do what I always like have loved to do since I since I can remember um and I think you asked me like where was that yeah, where, where did you grow that? up yeah yeah I, I bounced around a lot like a lot of uh Iranian refugees uh you know lots of different places um I grew up in a lot of different places but um a good part of it was in Florida um in or so in different parts of Florida how did your family end up here if I can ask uh, I think again, like like many Iranians, uh, 1978, 1979 didn't seem like the right place to be. So um, yeah. we 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 immigrated as refugees. I see. Yeah, I, I, as I my family did as well. Uh, uh, we immigrated as refugees after the Iran uh, after the revolution and after the Iran Iraq War started, but similarly. Um, uh, Mona, your same question to you. When did your interest in science, as far as you can remember, and mathematics begin? And uh, you know, from your experience, is my understanding, you grew up in, in Iran. So what was kind of the evolution of that process for you there? Right. Uh, so uh, as far as I can remember, I was always fascinated by different electronic gadgets. Uh, I was fortunate, like many of you, that my life from the time that I was born was coinciding with exponential uh, advancements we had in computing technologies, uh, in communication technologies, mobiles, every year new technologies would come and uh, really change the ways we would uh, interact with other human beings, internet. So I was always fascinated by this and wanted to be a part of it. Uh, initially, I wanted to understand better how these gadgets work uh, and that sort of led me more to math and physics uh, type of education that uh, I got in Iran uh, and uh, later pursued it here in US uh, during my graduate studies. You went to Sharif, which uh, I think is kind of notoriously difficult to get into. Uh, <laughs> What was that process? I, I think for many people who don't know, in Iran, they have a test called the Konkur, con which is basically like a test everyone has to take at the end of the And I, I think it's based off the French, the old French system, um, but it's everyone takes a test at the end of high school, and that kind of determines what the course of your secondary education or college level education is going to be. So there's a lot of pressure. What was that? I mean, it's not an experience I think us, for many of us who grew up in the US, had. What, what was that as a kind of a, a young woman trying to enter the area of science? Did you, what were the pressures surrounding that for you? 
Yeah, um, actually, that's a very interesting question because uh, now as an educator, as somebody in academia in US, uh, we always face the problem of diversity. We want to encourage one, more women to come to STEM field. And the more I think somehow Iran does a great job uh, in encouraging women to pursue a career in STEM. In fact, here we have to uh, find a solution, but in Iran, I don't know, is it like cultural, societal, somehow that is the way that women can be empowered. So they see a lot of role models and they see uh, that to have a, a successful and empowered, uh, empowered career, uh, this uh, going to STEM research, uh, re uh, STEM education is really the path to go. So I must say for me, it was really the matter of thinking what path I should go. It was the obvious choice that was in front of me with a long line of role models in front of me that I looked up to. Uh, and um, the resources were very much available. Well, as you said, Sharif University <clears throat> was a great place uh, for education. Um, a part of it is because they prepared me for a career in engineering and science, but more importantly, the environment. Like I found myself surrounded by a lot of bright minds with a lot of ambitions uh, that uh, really helped me uh, to uh, empower, to develop myself uh, and uh, basically get the encouragement that this kind of career path is open. You said something I think that gets at a deeper question that I've had, um, and I think uh, uh, one that is goes against me, the stereotypes people I think have of Iranian culture, but there is a lot of women in Iran and outside of Iran. I speak from my own experience. Most of my cousins in Iran have all entered into the fields of science and, and mathematics as computer scientists, physicists, uh, chemists. And um, I didn't go that route, much to the disappointment of my parents. I went into the arts um, and ended up a journalist, but Pardis, do you think there's something in your upbringing of where you kind of, is there something in Iranian culture, at least in your upbringing that encouraged you to go into this field? Is, do you think there's something there? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I actually, I, I had wanted to sort of jump in actually as Mona was speaking yeah. in that same way because I got excited about what she was saying. I think it's so true. I, I remember I was out in LA and I was doing um, a couple of talks um, and uh, like as I was being introduced, um, uh, it was actually like, I think one of them was like uh, um, uh, with Maz Jabrani was introducing me and talking about the work I'd done to a big audience. And there was a lot of like very um, like people from the arts and music. Like I was definitely like the least cool person on the stage that night by any kind of metric of US culture. Um, you know, I think yeah. the director of Mission Impossible, you know, like all, yeah. all Sam, you know. Uh, uh, so there was, uh, it was a lot like I was, yeah, I was not, culturally that interesting but I remember like getting one of the biggest draws of the night when they said that I graduated from honors from Harvard Medical School and like it erupted it was like a rock star kind of a situation of like <laughs> yes and I I remember and it you know and it happened again a little bit later in a smaller group and I was like I get it I was like nobody cares about this in the United States if you say you graduate like, good for you you know but this is rock star status is doing well in school in Iranian culture and um and I think about that in, when I think about American culture, as much as I, I you know, I, I, I have, you know, come to be an adopted American and I, I feel a, a lot of kinship to America. Um, but it is interesting that in America, it's cool to be good at sports. It's good to be cool at music. It's cool to be good looking. It's cool to be about, about good at anything except for school. There's like an opposite term for it, right? It's a nerd, right? It's that there, we, we really knock it down. And I think that when we do, it, it hurts women the most, right? right? Whatever kind of pressure society puts on people, I think women get the most driven out of it because their self-esteem is being pushed down so low that I, and I remember when I was actually going out for faculty, I, I uh, was at six different schools and literally at every school I went, some faculty came and asked me to go speak to their daughter to um, convince them that it was, it would, they shouldn't leave science. Um, and that, and, and they thought since I was in a band or something that I might be able to be the one to tell them like you could still have a life, but it was the band that was gonna convince them, not math. Um, and yeah. I think that that is the sense. And when I, I remember I, I sat with each of these young girls and they were really smart girls whose parents were professors in, in science. 
And somewhere around middle school, they felt an extreme pressure to hide their skills in, in math and science. Um, and then themselves internalized it to the point where they thought they either shouldn't do it or couldn't do it. Um, so it's extreme, but coming back to Iran, I mean, I, I have to say like, I, I was, it was, it was funny. I, I had, you know, that is for, you know, on some things it's like, you have to be like a doctor or more this, you, you know, to, to, so in some, in some ways the pressure is a little extreme, um, yeah. but in other ways it's, it's kind of delightful that at least they do encourage and support us to get our training and our education. And I, I agree that my, you know, um, my dad, uh, he has two daughters. He, he's always been happy with his two daughters. He's never, he always put, he never, I never once told, he heard him tell me about, I have to get married or anything like that. It was always about, I have to do well in school. So it, it's a very different mindset. And I don't, and I, I think that people don't really appreciate and understand that, that actually in a lot of ways, um, there's a lot of gender equity in the way that we all get pressured by our parents uh, to do well in school so, similarly, so. Yes, right, and it's and it's generally not seen as, uh, you know, well, I know this for people from people who worked in Iran. There is obviously always going to be uh, gender. There is gender discrimination in the actual the field of, of work, but there, the amount of cases you hear about anecdotally, and also the, the statistics bear this out of people, let's say, parents saying to their daughters, "You can't go into medicine, or you shouldn't go. This is not a field for women." to go yeah. into math or science. There is none of that. <laughs> I mean, for the most part, and you, and it shows in the numbers of people who are graduating in particular areas um, in, yeah. in Iran. I mean, the women dominate um, uh, graduate degrees in general um, and with particular focus in math and sciences. Um, All kinds of so, limitations that are imposed uh, on women, in fact, they backfire in the way that uh, they go further way to mm -hmm. prove themselves uh, to get the equal position that they deserve. And that might be another factor that is helping uh, having more women in science in Iran. Yes, yes, that's very true. And the, you know, the other thing I was curious about is growing up in your families, did you have a sense of uh, the long, because I'm a history nerd. One of the things I really love is that Iran has a, you know, many hundred, maybe thousand millennia old tradition of math and science from, you know, Ali Abusina or Avicina is known in the West. Many, you know, institutions are named after him. I mean, one of France's largest uh, uh, science institutions is named after him. He's legendary even in the West for his contributions to math and science, but he's just one of many. Um, was this something you grew up uh, with awareness of at all? I mean, I did in my family, um, but I was wondering if this was even kind of, did you feel that uh, entering this field as an Iranian is kind of, you're continuing among a long line of, you know, historical, but also current um, folks who have really contributed to the field that are Iranian? Of course, I think one thing that Iranians do very well is being proud of their heritage and uh, all the uh, great contributions. Maybe too well. Maybe too well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say. So, yeah. Um, of course, we've heard uh, about Abyssinia. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Rumi, Abyssinia, always. But yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just wanted to say, yeah, from uh, the first years of childhood, uh, from the conversation you hear, who you should look up to, uh, the movies that you see, the history of life of all these legends, and that school history, there has been always a lot of uh, emphasis. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the, uh, the positives, uh, but I also want to ask you, sort of, in your careers as adults, particularly entering this field, ha have you ever felt any part of your identity uh, has been a source of a challenge in, in moving forward in your field? Have you felt discriminated against or left out of particular opportunities, either in overt or subtle ways? We'll start with you, uh, Pags. Did you, have you ever had oh, that? Oh, yeah, experience? I mean, it's nonstop. It's nonstop. I, I don't oh, know. I mean, me it's, not, it's not like subtle. It's, it is nonstop. I mean, it is, I don't, I don't think I want to get into this, but like, I just to, to tell you if to be a woman in science, it's not just subtle. It's they will try to stop you at every front. They will everything is is not not in school, not in early career, but as soon as you kind of rise to faculty, I I don't know if you Mona maybe you've been I, like lucky enough, but I, there's I mean, it, well actually I would say actually it started in graduate school. I think it started in graduate school it was very clear, um, and uh, all of my female um, there's a there was like a Rhodes women's group that was a support group. 
for all of the women whose um, whose professors would overtly say things like, I and mean, I think one of them as an example, but just a very simple example. It wasn't it wasn't a surprise to any of us, you know. Basically, she overheard one of her professors explaining to another professor about how a woman's brain begins to decay at the age of 18. But this is a pervasive, you know, belief. Um, and uh, and so, I mean, I think I, 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 there's not a day or a week that doesn't, you know, that, that I don't hear stories or have stories or experience stories. It's almost like not worth getting into here because um, it would just open up a can of worms that never ends. But I think that I've the multiple times that the, the stakes have been too high and the just outrageous, uh, things I've had to deal with have been too much. Um, my, I remember like one particular instance, a woman who worked for me sort of said, look, if you don't hang on, then like there literally is no hope for the rest of us. And I remember that was the moment where I was like, oh, I guess I have to keep in it. Um, is that, I mean, right, the Me Too movement, like the, the fact is that on earth, just one layer. If, if, if we have to be just happy that we're not being sexually harassed overtly in the office, like, what layer are we talking about is success here? Um, that that if that if that so it is the world needs to change. It's not even close to understanding a woman, uh, if, particularly a woman with ambition. Um, and I think that uh, that ultimately the only thing we can do is to keep at it and laugh and find people that that I'm I'm basically people oftentimes because I've had I have a couple of real doozies of, of storylines and people have told me to write a memoir and I'm like, I'm working on a sitcom. Uh, at some point it'll come out with a sitcom. It's more of a Silicon Valley kind of a situation, but um, it's, a, it's a different version. I don't really want to get wow. into it on the hard side. No, I but totally it is, understand. It yes. is almost laughable, but um, but it is what it is, so. Mona, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, how, how yeah, I must experience? say, I, uh, I fortunately was uh, personally not affected much. Uh, so I must say I have faced a lot of challenges uh, like many others in this career. Some of them, um, I sometimes get suspicious. Is it because I'm a woman, but I cannot trace it directly back to see uh, if it was a gender specific discrimination. But that being said, said uh, the problem is out there nobody can uh, deny it I mean I hear a lot of uh, stories from colleagues and statistics shows I mean uh, definitely the number of uh, women who hold key academic and industrial positions is very low uh, there's some pipeline problem but there is some leaky pipeline problem where they are discouraged along the way uh, definitely uh, there are serious problems that should be addressed um, I appreciate both of those answers. I mean, I, I think one of the, I guess the one quick follow-up is, and then I, I want to ask, ask you about your specific areas of work and what you're interested in, um, is do you think there's any kind of generational element to it? Have you found that the uh, the kind of younger folks have a different attitude about it than many of the more traditional kind of um, older men who work in the field of science? Is it, be, is it partly because they're, you know, it's dominated by many people who worked in the science at the time where like women were just not welcome at all. Is there a change? I, I think that is part of it. Like if I was to look to see what, um, yeah, I mean, probably, but yeah. I don't know. It's sort of hard to know until people get into positions of power to see what they'll do and how they act. Um, that's a and good Mona's right. Like that's the problem. You always, when I was in my graduate school, I, it was more like, it took me a long time. I think it's actually harder when it's insidious where Mona, where you can question yourself. You're like, is it because my ideas aren't good? Is it because I'm a woman? You don't know. A couple of times when I finally got the clarity, when it became so obvious, all, all of the people that were, whose ideas were being ignored uh, were women. It just sort of was like, oh wait, is this a gender thing? I'm like, oh, this is no problem. That, Cause I, I basically in the, in the process in graduate school, I lost a lot of confidence in myself because none of my ideas were respected or appreciated or put anywhere. And I almost just like left the field thinking, I don't know how to do science. Um, and I had a qualifying exam where three, eight, you know, 70, 80 year old white men were basically telling me that I, my essentially was telling me my brain was decayed and I, it was pointless and I shouldn't continue. Um, they tried to fail me out of my program um, and just thought every idea I put was laughable. And they ended up making my career later when I finally got to publish them. But like that, it took me a while. I, th there's many women whose stories are that, that that event would have been the end of them. And it almost was the end of me until in that instance, I kind of had enough women in my network uh, that made me understand the phenomenon. But that's the the layer you live on is you don't know what is 
and what isn't you? Mm. And I always push people to always ask yourself, what can I be doing better? And let me, I think Mona said something to that effect that it pushes us to have to be better and better and better. And so I always try to use it to sort of say, what have I done and brought to the table? And then now, you know, after I've done that with some clarity, try to understand the situation and what I'm up against. Um, but that said, so it's sort of hard to know if this next generation is better. Some things suggest they are, some things suggest that the culture, uh, you know, is there's a lot of things that are not good. Um, you know, you're seeing, we're seeing more bullying online and more other bad behavior online. So, you know, it, we will see how this generation does and fares, um, you know, for humanity. But, um, but yeah, obviously, yes, a lot of, a lot of uh, the older men are just not used to seeing women and, and they're having to take a step. And some of that I respect. And I actually, you know, I'm not the kind to even judge them. I'm just more trying to figure out how to get myself to the right place. Um, but right. I think when you yes. ask me that question, yes, it's yeah. pervasive. And I don't try to say that it's anything, but I think that's not right. fair to other people, but I also don't want women out there to see the world as just that. Right. So I kind of say there's three buckets of people. There's a bucket of people that, um, you know, are actually quite good and they're there to help you. And they're trying to make things better for you. There's a bucket of people that could go either way and they can have good days and bad days or good positions. And you kind of have to so you have to navigate them. And there's a bucket of people who are truly going to make your life miserable. And you have to figure out, you have to get the ability to see the difference between them, avoid the people that will you know, destroy you, navigate the people who are going to give you a potentially hard time, try to find the people that um, you know, will help you and will be part of your journey and figure out the ability to distinguish between them. Because when you lose people, it's when they get to the point where they just assume everybody's out to get them. And that's, I, that breaks my heart you know, where they just have lost so much trust, they've kind of gotten knocked down so much that they no longer, you know, they kind of end up full, falling into a, just a uh, giving up uh, on themselves as much as on everybody else around them. Um, so that's the struggle. So I just want you to know it's out there. Well said. But it's not everything. I think that's really well said. And I, you know, the, both of your examples and your careers and your attitudes towards the work, I think are great models for people who are trying to take that step because you're acknowledging the challenges, but also the kind of value of uh, pushing, pushing through and staying in the game, which you both have. Um, so about that, about the work you actually do, I, I'm really, I'm really fascinated by both your areas of research. Um, Mona, just to start with you, um, it's and correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand as a not science person, a lot of your research is based around computational speed. Is that I'm processing speed? Is that more like I'm I'm fascinated by what how you got interested in that and what impact your area of research and study, what you want it to have on our kind of daily lives uh, down the line, kind of uh, as, as we live in the world. And then the same question is gonna to go to you next, Patty. Sure. So as I was mentioning in my answer to your uh, earlier question, my motivation to get into the field I'm in, it was really the kind of gadgets that revolutionized the life I saw from the time I was born. Every year, new computers with uh, and new mobile phones were coming. And always the uh, very distinguishing factor that made these technologies better and better was faster processing speed, uh, higher bandwidth, faster communication rates. So I love to be part of that journey and contribute. So um, I studied everything related to high-speed electronics. So. Um, I learned some background when, when I came to US, I got familiar with uh, a broader scope of opportunities, mainly uh, the broad electromagnetic spectrum we have, and it goes everywhere from radio frequency to X-ray, gamma rays, like there's so many opportunities out there. And there was uh, these particular parts of the spectrum that there were these waves with very interesting uh, properties that can do marvelous things, but we don't have access to them because we don't have the right gadgets. We don't have the right transmitters, receivers. And that made me particularly interested in the terahertz frequency range. Uh, these are very unique uh, waves that uh, basically can penetrate into a lot of optically opaque materials. So you can access environments that you don't see. But at the same time, uh, molecules and chemicals have very interesting responses to these waves. Uh, they they are, uh, basically, they get vibrations and rotations. So that allows you to technically access an, a non-accessible region and get chemical information. So that opens up a lot of opportunities, uh, not only for imaging, but also sensing. Uh, and uh, it happens to be that these waves are also very high frequency. So 
they uh, change the speed that we uh, transfer data in communication or co computation. Uh, so a lot of my current work is around building new devices, new technologies that can work at this frequency and systems that can work at this frequency. And is the ultimate hope that in making make changes in what you said around imaging, what other kind of kind of um, effects will it have potentially down the line on our day-to-day -day lives? Like this area. It would be exactly. It would be a complementary tool to a lot of great tools we have available. Uh, for example, uh, currently in astrophysics studies, we have great tools, telescopes uh, that can see a lot of phenomena in space, but it happens that a lot of star formation, galaxy formation are happening in a very dusty cloud environments that there is no way we can see. And these particular waves, in fact, can penetrate through these uh, regions. And amazingly from Earth or Earth orbit, one can see what is happening in galaxies very far from us uh, by just having a very sensitive sensor that works at these kinds of frequencies. This is just one example of the kind of gadgets we are building, but you can extend it to a lot of medical imaging, spectroscopy, biosensing uh, kind of platforms that just adds new functionalities that we didn't have before. May be able to de detect diseases or uh... Uh, other kind of abnormalities in the body, potentially, right through the imaging. The sci the sci fi element of this is around the de detecting of uh, uh, being able to see deeper into space or into different spaces uh, in space. And okay. as a sci fi uh, reader and nerd myself, I love that it's such a uh, fascinating image that some of the research and this is something about science that I really love is the work both of you do right in your specific areas open the door for someone else to take that research or any kind of breakthrough that's there and build on it. And generations down the line, sometimes, sometimes years down the line, you have a breakthrough that is a much more tangible one for people in their daily lives. But it's this process of kind of passing the baton of research and knowledge onto the next person. It's such a um, uh, collectivist act in its own sense, but over time, right? Um, and I, I, I love that uh, description about your kind of uh, your area of research. Um, uh, Paradis, you also work in an area that also has some sci-fi qualities to it. I mean, it looks into the past, but the idea of genetics and, and looking at history to help us kind of better identify disease or other kind of abnormalities, or normalities, whatever they are in the human body. Can you talk a little bit about how you got interested in that very fascinating area of science? Yeah, I mean, I think I came of age just around it kind of scientifically or as a researcher, just as uh, genomics was really starting to pick up speed um, as we are getting better and better abilities to sequencing was getting more powerful. Sequencing is the way we read out uh, the uh, our genomes, um, the uh, basically this almost like an uh, instruction manual for how we make all of our different parts is it's coded in our DNA in this giant thing. It's three billion letters long. And we were going through and we were starting to get better and better at sequencing our own genome and the genomes of other organisms on earth. And there's all this data coming in and really hard to interpret it. So I kind of cut my teeth in human genetics where I was really trying to understand some different kind of things about what are all these genes? What do they do? What are the mutations that are popping up that are different between people? How do they uh, affect our biology? Um, and as somebody who loves data and who loves math, I started realizing there are certain pattern patterns in the DNA that you could actually um, identify these mutations across the, our, our genomes. And, um, and you could see like how prevalent they were in the population, but you could actually use the pattern of genetic diversity in the area. And so sort of, it won't be a little hard to get into, but basically you could date the mutations. You could use other things that were going on to figure out how long the mutation been around. And there's some math that's involved with that of how to like accurately figure that out. What I, what I ended up looking for were mutations that had become really common in the human population, but had done so really fast, too fast to be explained by chance. And what were they doing and why are they biologically meaningful? And so one of the first ones that, that people had discovered before this was the sickle cell mutation that was protective from malaria and shown that in fact it had risen in prevalence because it, it uh, conferred resistance to malaria and had kind of emerged in all these different tropical regions of the world where malaria is endemic. Uh, and I was able to kind of take these statistics, build them out, apply them on a, this, across the 3 billion kind of nucleotides of the genome and find all sorts of different things. Um, you know, lots of different mutations that are important in 
pigmentation, lactose tolerance, uh, our sweat and our hair as we move from population to population. So it's sort of just like this really neat tool. I, I really like to develop, I, I like to look at data. I like to just see what kind of math can, can show me. And I look for, for patterns is the kind of thing that I enjoy doing. And, um, and so for me, it was just looking at these patterns and finding them again and again, and then seeing what they link to. And then one particular one of those that really caught my attention was the strongest signal that we found at that time in any human population, but it, it, it sprung up in an African population, the Yoruba of Nigeria. And it was a, a mutation that was uh, in doing some investigations linked to the entry of a particular virus called Lassa virus, which is like Ebola, a hemorrhagic fever virus. And so then I started thinking about that a little bit more. And essentially I describe it all like a scavenger hunt. It's like you pull one thread that leads to another, mm -hmm. leads to another, and you're just exploring. But it ended up taking me to West Africa where I started studying this Lassa virus. And then before I knew it, I just started studying viruses. And the thing that I just talked to you about, the fact that you can, you know, that whole pattern that you're looking for, a mu new yeah. mutation that rises too quickly than expected by chance that might be biologically meaningful. We're seeing that all the time now. You're hearing about it in the news. These are called variants of concern. Right, the the new the the delta the alpha. That's what this is. This is just natural selection in action in real time that we're seeing. And so we're now applying the same kinds of statistics and methods to see how are these viruses changing. And, and they just they change a lot faster. They spread a lot faster. They change a lot faster. We can see it over our lifetime. So a lot of the work my lab has done in the last few years is to track these viruses and see how the viruses are changing. We identified a number of mutations that, that sprung up early during the Ebola outbreak. That we think changed the trajectory. If you rem if you recall, like there was Ebola and people were like, oh, there's this thing, but then suddenly it was everywhere. And it the time when it suddenly was everywhere, there was a mutation that popped up that changed the virus's infectivity. And same thing with SARS-CoV-2. People were worried about it a little bit, and then something started happening in Italy that was percolating, and then suddenly it was everywhere. And at that time, D this D614G mutation popped up, which is the first of the variants of concern. Um, and now they're everywhere. But that's basically, yeah, so so we're kind of using it both to study our own history, but also to track uh, how viruses change and, and stay, uh, you know, viruses, microbes are really interesting because they both have had such a major impact on our history uh, and are themselves changing so much in time. And so uh, those are kind of some of the pieces, but generally my work is kind of all over the place, but it's, uh, it's just finding these patterns in nature and just following them until we, we um, you know, keep going with it. Well, it's fascinating because the past uh, or you all being able to see into the past of genetic mutation allows you to predict where that future mutation might go, right? Is that more or less what understanding the past allows you to do currently with things that are happening today or may happen in the future? Yeah, understanding the past gets us to biology, just simply understanding some landscape of biology. It tells us which mutations to pay attention to and what they might be doing. But like you said, it does point us to like if if there's if we look in the genome and there's these massive footprints of viral you know like some arms race with viruses, uh, yeah. it's a reminder that yes those are the, that's going to be the big thing that's going to shift to us. Um, uh, but also when we start seeing um, these different mutations pop up, we start to the the you know they, there's that old adage um, you know history doesn't repeat but it rhymes and I do think yeah. there is a there is a rhyme in there and you start to figure it out and it helps you. Um, and, and we can very specifically create predictive models that do even better than that, really try to figure out which mutations will pop up where and how they'll move and, and try to help kind of direct our resources to the right places. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so many mutations tell us a lot about where we, where we all come from. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating, like lactose intolerance, which you mentioned, uh, uh, knowing, having a lactose, lactose intolerance will tell you something about where your ancestors might have come from, right? There's that too. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, no, genetics is really like one of the most profound, um, change, you know, uh, um, transformations in history uh, is the ability, I mean, literally like I did one study where we we're studying population from Bangladesh and we could tell exactly when uh, there was um, migration and events from Asia with, because like, you know, it was like something like 52 generations ago, plus or minus two generations, like that's when the data is so clean and so rigorous and presents such a really good molecular clock um, that my colleague David Reich has just been amazing about figuring out the history of all of these populations um, by just knowing like 30 generations ago, this happened. And I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable um, what we can tell with that. Yeah, and, and just apply to Iranians, bring it back to our identity. I mean, it's just, uh, my understanding is genetics have allowed them to understand where the migration patterns were coming into Iran, like say, 
five or six thousand years ago that make up the people today called yeah Linus, and right? as and one so, suspected we are a pretty diverse group of people we're just yes. we just got invaded by everybody so we are yeah exactly are exactly yeah there yeah it's 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 a fascinating kind of reality and what's interesting mona is uh it's my understanding is is, is technology, CRISPR, and also other technologies have made genetics able to kind of, we, for us to be able to see deeper into genetic past and genetic history. So your area of study is almost like potentially going to open up the, those kind of similar doors for other areas of medical research and, you know, astronomy and other kinds of, phys, you know, um, uh, uh, physics, et cetera. Is that kind of the hope that, that those doors are open for that's the hope and that's the pattern we have seen. Technology advancement and new discoveries have always gone hand in hand. Uh, we see uh, in, the uh, in the Nobel Prize winners uh, biographies, like a lot of them in physics, the contributions is that a certain instrument that was developed enabled many high impact discoveries eventually. Uh, and nowadays, uh, the science is so broad. There's so many opportunities at the interface between fields that really these kinds of advancements should go hand in hand. And I hope our technology can also help with uh, a lot of uh, biology and biophysics discoveries. Yeah, one uh, unique thing about, uh, again, uh, the kind of uh, wavelengths that we are exploring is that we have a lot of excellent tools like microscopes, uh, near field microscopes that give a lot of good information about structural, uh, properties of molecules and chemicals. But uh, really when it gets to studying the dynamics, how from one state to another state a biomolecule changes, uh, we are very limited. Uh, a lot of labeling techniques has to be used to trace the transformations and a lot of them are limiting uh, the measurement capability. They basically interfere with the natural operation of the molecule. And what is unique with terahertz waves is that whenever a chemical bond is um, detached or new chemical bond is formed, we can sense it remotely without having to use any label. And that is an important feature that we feel uh, would be revolutionary to allow to study dynamics of these biological processes in a label-free way. That's, that's that's fascinating. I mean, this is just fascinating. You almost want to see the future, how this all of these these technologies are going to like pan out and and um, and grow. Um, uh, one question I have is, um, have you have you all kept in kind of kept tabs on science in Iran in particular? And the, I'm going to bring this back to another question about kind of because you both teach here, right? You teach students here. So uh, what, is, what is your kind of sense of scientific research in Iran? And, and have you kept tabs on it? Where do you think it's going? And I'm gonna, after you answer this question, I promise I will bring it back here to your own experience as teachers. So have either of you kind of kept tabs on science in Iran? Have you been? I mean, I, uh, you know, I, try, I do my best to interact with, uh, I, get, I get a lot of reach outs from Iran. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're reaching out, I, I do better on email uh, than on social media. I'm terrible. So I, I do my best, but I'm really not there. Um, so I kind of have to go on and remind myself too. But I mean, I, I do, I, where I, wherever I can, I've had a lot of Iranian students here in the United States. So um, obviously my own relationship with Iran and going back there is complicated, but um, but I, I, this is my heritage. This is who I am. So uh, I've had, I've had, it, 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 there's a lot of Farsi in the lab, you know, and there's a lot of Chai yes. in the lab and Pistin. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and uh, most recently, for example, uh, one of my um, postdocs who was at Sharif University and uh, um, uh, his name is Sharif Tababor Bar, uh, came to my lab and um, uh, invented a super cool technology uh, where he was able to um, uh, take viruses, um, and actually take this um, a particular kind of virus called AAV, which is a a, a virus that actually doesn't doesn't cause any harm, uh, but and viruses. What, what people little don't know is viruses are actually usually helpful. They they do a lot of really good things in our in our uh, in nature. And one thing they can really do well is deliver um, uh, information. Uh, they kind of can enter cells and deliver information in a really powerful way. And one of the things these healthy viruses can do is they can um, deliver gene therapy. So there's so, so CRISPR and all these technologies has nice. made it so that. Um, we can, um, uh, so that we can possibly change mutations for these debilitating genetic diseases, 
like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or other muscular mm -hmm. diseases or brain diseases, particularly those that affect children, um, they are genetic changes. And if we could change those specific mutations where, they, where they're happening and most important in the body, we could actually help recover and, and make people healthy. And so he just, um, he and uh, uh, led um, a team for my group, but really, you know, his, his brilliance drove uh, the work where we were able to um, engineer these AAVs to specifically deliver therapies uh, into muscle for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and other muscular um, uh, genetic diseases. Um, and I mean, you know, and it, it was really fun that we just did a BBC Persian on it and it was fun to get to talk to, about him and, and all he's achieved. But, uh, for me, I mean, I, you know, like he is, uh, he's a standout amongst, but amongst an incredible amount of brilliant, uh, folks. So we, we welcome folks from Iran. It's more difficult to get them directly from Iran, but I'm always paying attention and I'm, I'm doing my best to kind of keep up, um, and just to be supportive. Um, cause I think, uh, Mona just exemplifies, uh, what, what a great educational system they have there and, um, and what brilliant minds are, are there. So I, I think where people get stuck is I think at that higher level, there becomes more challenges, right. To be able to, the, the, they don't have the support and resources to kind of keep moving the fort forward. So that often happens where they do their early education there, but then come out for graduate school and beyond. And I think that's, um, that's what we're seeing a lot of, um, and obviously it's really important that our immigration policies uh, allows for for that to happen, uh, both for them and for for the U.S. if they want to be competitive. Yes, absolutely, and I think that was a Mona. You're an ex example of that of someone who did their kind of uh, primary education in, in this in the area of science and then came here for to continue that. Uh, obviously, points yeah. to how much the U.S. benefits, you know, from from outside folks coming in. But what was your, how about your experience in this area? Right. Actually, like Paradis, uh, I also interacted with a lot of Iranians uh, that uh, came from Iran uh, initially as an international student, the mm -hmm. next generation students that were coming and later uh, as an educator, new students that we were recruiting. Uh, we always have a great experience with Iranian students. Uh, unfortunately, during the previous administration, uh, there were serious limitations uh, in visas. So that pool mm -hmm. got much narrower, which uh, hopefully now things are getting better. Uh, so through these students, I uh, basically up, uh, uh, basically get familiar with what new trends are happening, what new areas they're exploring. And other than that, I mean, now scientific community is very connected. We have a lot of conferences, journal publications through that. Uh, we can easily follow what is happening, not only in Iran, in any part of the world. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot of changes since I was there. Uh, I didn't do uh, my graduate studies there, so I don't, I'm not familiar with research environment at those times, but a lot of competitive research is happening there, unfortunately. Uh, there are some limitations in terms of resources, equipment that they can uh, have because of sanctions. But it's amazing with the limited resources, what kind of great work uh, is done. And I'm hoping that just restrictions are reduced so that we can see more and more great things out of Iranian students and scholars. Yeah, that makes a lot. Uh, before we keep going, I just want to let uh, folks, participants know that they can uh, put their questions in the Q&A box, which is down on the bottom of your screen to the right. You should see a, a little button that says Q&A. You can hit that and send us some of your questions. And uh, I will ask them as we're going on in the conversation here. Um, I, you're both teachers as well, right? Like you also have students, you teach them, you mentor them. Um, given what you're seeing, you talked about this a little bit, Paradis, but given what you're seeing, uh, this is a spicy question, but what are you? What are your views on sort of how the American education system is preparing students? I mean, you're both at prestigious universities. You're getting probably some of the best and brightest, but do are, are, do you see some differences in level of preparation for students that come through the education system here versus in Iran, for example, or other places where they're coming through a very kind of rigorous, you know, hyper competitive process to get to this place? Are you hopeful for the future of American science? given what you're seeing? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think America still does produce a lot of incredible scientists. I don't, I'm not concerned about that as a whole, like at those, at that, 
you know, and, and the folks that are coming through the schools that we're, we're at, you're getting, you know, incredible um, uh, people, but many of whom have incredible privilege and incredible support systems. I think the bigger issue is um, the you know, disparity in education uh, across the country, across the world, right? I think you want meritocracy, um, like a equality of opportunity to really be out there. And I think it's, it's a shame, like you just see it even in the same town, just how extreme the opportunities are that are different. So I think that U.S. does well on the, those kind of, um, you know, uh, on these like outlier tiers, and it does well in the um, university system, which is why a lot of people come for either university or graduate school. But I think in the K through 12 standardized education across America, there's a, a lot to be, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a, a there there's a lot of development that's needed. I think even in the, I mean, to be honest, like some of the stuff in education, it's just like beyond the kind of, uh, you know, some teachers who don't want to teach uh, in some places and the kind of some of the, you know, uh, the focus on testing and not so much on learning. There's all that, but like also just what are we teaching? It's so interesting how like so much of what is being taught in American uh, K through 12 education has just not been updated as to what is practical and necessary for someone to survive, right? Like we, we know Pythagorean theorem, there's all these things yes. we all know, but we don't know how to yeah. do our own taxes and we don't know sort of basics of how the government works. There's like some really, there's some real gaps in what we're teaching um, uh, that I, I think it's just like, continuing to, to update um, as well, and then figure out how to implement that in a way that gives a lot of opportunity. And obviously because of the fact, in some ways, the fact that things are going online helps that, you know, there's a lot more students who are eager somewhere um, can learn um, and, and find the resources they need to teach, sort of teach themselves. Um, but of course, the fact that the pandemic has really widened that disparity tells us that that's not gonna solve everything. Um, that we do need good in-person education that is supportive to uh, people across uh, the demographic and economic spectrum is going to be really important. Um, we're getting one question here from uh, from the audience, which is very interesting. I'm going to kind of take two questions and make them one, which is, um, is there a mechanism by which Iranian women scientists kind of stay in touch or able to, is there an organization or some kind of uh, informal one even where folks are able to stay in touch and um, well I'll, I'll ask that first and there's a kind of a second question that's related is there anything that's out there in which you all stay in touch or communicate um, I'm not aware of one particular one with that uh, focus that you mentioned there are a lot of organizations uh, that I sometimes keep as uh, can, uh, cannot keep track of them mm -hmm. uh, but usually in scientific communities, uh, there are, for example, women in engineering, women in optics, like the kind of societies I'm involved with, that those kinds of uh, communities and groups are available. Yeah, and I mean, I, there, I mean, obviously a lot of really great, uh, like Iranian organizations um, and groups and, you know, uh, um, like Paya and others that are, you know, doing a lot of really great work out there. Um, it's hard, I think, you know, it, it is, it's hard to communicate. It's hard to find the right channel to communicate um, and to keep up. I think uh, as, you know, the, the truth of it is as professors, I teach a class of 400 students a semester and I have, I run a lab of 60 members of my group. I can't keep up with myself. It, it, uh, you know, that's the honesty of the truth of it is that um, imagine if each one of those students, each one of those students wants their own time. Um, it's difficult. And I think it's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's a challenge. So for everybody who I haven't replied to or haven't replied to in a timely fashion, I apologize. It's just, you, you know, it's the, the very difficult thing that our work is really sitting by ourselves looking at, you know, data. And, um, and uh, while we want to be able to be able to communicate in forums like this are a good opportunity to speak and to talk, um, that's, that's the really hard part. You know, that's why I'm not really on social media and other things. It's just, it's really difficult to be. I try, I try to pop on um you know and and share information when i can take information when i can but um there are just not enough hours in the day uh so that that is you know the shame of it i i don't i'm not saying i'm not proud of that fact but uh but we do end up working 24 hours a day seven days a week and um it makes it really difficult um where we're, but i do know that like a lot of 
when we get to be the place where we're successful, um, it's important to also be accessible to others. Um, and that, that's, that's the, the thing I'm trying to figure out how to carve out time for, but it's yes, difficult. Yeah. It's always difficult, I think, to keep that line of communication. That's why it's often useful when there are actual, like, there's actually funding and staff to just create that mechanism. And I think it, you know, hopefully someone is uh, funders on this call and may want to do that. But be, I think it's at some point someone will hopefully step in with some kind of help to, to kind of facilitate that. Um, quickly, a couple of last questions. Uh, and then, you know, I want to offer you both kind of a, a concluding thought. But uh, one question here, um, which is for you, uh, Paradis, which is what made you, this is an interesting one, what made you decide to work kind of in research science versus medicine? Because you also have, you know, you're also a doctor, like what uh, contributed to your de decisions to, to go in that route? In that route. Yeah, so um, yeah, that is a question I get asked a lot because there's always that question of medicine versus research amongst my students. Um, and I mean, the kind of story I tell is my, you know, my dad's a very funny guy and anybody who's like been a um, kind of a child of an of, of immigrant family and a refugee family, it's all about stability. It's like, okay, let's yeah, right. I mean, he, he, you know, our lives were very unstable. And so he's like stability. So as a, you know, as a kid, he used to kind of amuse himself being like, you know, you can be anything you want to be in the world. The world is your oyster, a doctor or a lawyer, like whatever you want, you could be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, and those <laughs> are the choices that my sister and I were kind of given us and he sort of cracked himself up. But that was sort of like, that was kind of the options. I remember at one point I wanted to be a writer and he's like, mm, yeah, no. Um, so, uh, and of course he would have supported anything we did, but he really was pushing for that. And, um, uh, my mom was very much like, whatever you want to do. Um, but, uh, so my sister became a lawyer, I became a doctor and neither of us practice what we do. Um, wow. uh, and, and it fit for me. Like I actually, like I said, I, it was not just my dad saying it, it fit for me. I liked science. I liked math and I didn't really understand my options. And so I really did think if you like science and math, like you, that's, you become a doctor and I liked it because for externally, I, I like, to me, it's important to take care of people, be caring, be kind, be empathetic. Mm -hmm. And so all of that fit, I, 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 the way I describe it is I made the choice to be a doctor based on kind of my external value system, right? What I think like is the right thing to do. And someone who's caring for other people seems like a good kind of person to be. And so that's how I made my choice. And I, and I started medical school and I actually only fell upon research. I never wanted to do research like per se. I never, I just never knew what it was to be honest. But when I went to MIT, I, I went to MIT because I saw this video about people making robots and doing math. And I was like, this is where I'm supposed That's to be. Good. So I did yeah. go there just by that. I just wanted to be in a place where people thought robots were cool. Um, and But when I was there, I then trying to figure out what you have to do for medical school, um, I started realizing I did do research. So I did the research and I kind of just did it like a good student. And then when I got the opportunity, this is a bit of a windy story and I apologize, but when I, because it makes no sense. I, I, okay, no. Like, Basically, I got the uh, that uh, Rhodes Scholarship out of college, which was, again, kind of random. I ended up in England, and I was like, what am I going to do with myself? And before I knew it, I got a PhD. It really was that. I'm embarrassed to say, like, I actually didn't, I didn't even, I didn't, like, go there to do a PhD, I kind of stumbled into it. And, um, and when I started medical school, I was like, boy, all this other stuff I did was this kind of random thing, but now I'm starting my career path. And I started at that same time with a friend of mine who was MD, PhD, and who was guaranteed he was he was going to go into research and I was like there to do my medicine and now he's a doctor and I'm a researcher and so when I talk to my students about how you know how to make that choice I use that example of my friend and I and how we switched and you know he really his external value system is I'm an innovator I'm a person on the front, front edge I'm the one kind of people that change the world and I made it of I care for people um you know like uh you know I'm a good uh Iranian daughter I do you know all the I made the, these kinds of choices, but basically we ended up doing switching paths because of how we want to spend our day, what causes us, what drives us crazy, um, what, you know, what, what kind of things we can take. And so for me, um, I don't like the hierarchy of medicine at all. Like I go really bananas on it and I, and I don't like the kind of, we do it because we did it. There's just a lot of, you have to do things in a certain way. Um, and, and also kind of just to be there, I, I'm not very good at small talk. I'm much better at real talk, but like yeah. pleasantries, cocktail party, I'm just, it's not my thing. So all those things, like, I was just like, I can't do this. And for him, he didn't like ambiguity, which is like in science and research, you're just yeah. there's so much ambiguity. You don't know where you're going in this terrain that's all over the place. And failure is just kind of like a daily grind. That's part of it. You, you know, you go through the failures to get success. 
And so, you know, both of us um, ended up basically choosing what we want to do based on the things that we, that just were like deal breakers for us and the things that like drove us and got us excited. And so it is really important when you're thinking about what you want to do in your life to really check in with yourself and with what it really means to spend the day to day doing these things. If I look back on my life, it's all obvious that I would end up being a researcher, but um, I see what, why at different checkpoints, I thought medicine was where I was supposed to be. Which, which makes sense because these are human experiences, human decisions that we do. We make these choices every day because it makes, it makes us feel good. It gives us life. You know, one thing I'm interested in is you both have very intense jobs. Obviously, science is a rigorous career. People, you know, should know that going into it. Um, but, you know, starting with you, Mona, what is it outside of work that gives you the energy and the kind of breathes life into your, uh, that you do, that breathes life and gives you energy and able, allows you to do your job? Uh, on a daily basis? Yeah, I'm uh, asked that question often uh, together with how you balance your work and uh, personal life. So uh, I must say a huge amount of uh, pleasure comes, uh, joy comes really from work, like uh, on a daily basis, uh, if uh, somebody else looks at my life, might not consider me a very balanced person considering the number of hours I work. Uh, but uh, that gives a lot of satisfaction, not that I don't do anything else in my life, uh, but uh, like anybody else, uh, I'm fortunate to have great friends and family uh, that I enjoy spending time uh, with them. Uh, I'm very fortunate that um, my husband is in the same career with the same kind of uh, work schedule, so he's very understanding and even helping me. Uh, so. Uh, from outside, I might look miserable, but <laughs> I'm enjoying what I'm doing. No, you don't. You don't see miserable at all. <laughs> uh, but that that's wonderful. Um, I, I think it's a uh, de- deriving that much joy from your work, which I, I have the same issue. Uh, I, I, I have many interests, but I derive so much joy from work. I find myself doing it probably more way more than I than I should. Um, uh, Padish, you're in, you're in a band. I mean, just like me, you're a musician. Uh, how how does music? influence your work as a scientist and vice versa? How does science influence your music? And not, I mean, it doesn't really. I would say that, that I don't think science, science does. I'm not the one of the people that's like writing about, uh, um, about you know, science in my music, but, it, um, but they, I say that they're very parallel. Uh, and a phrase I've, I've often said, because it's just so true, is that people underestimate the creativity you need in science and the rigor you need in music. And it's mm. just, it's very true. Like both of them mm-hmm. start with kind of exploring a space and seeing where you would go. Um, uh, but then re- then require you to kind of uh, hone down and create the proofs and like bring that out into the world, which requires a lot of like, uh, so basically in, in the scientific process, you're like exploring all the space, trying to f- figure out where to discover. You go in all these directions and then you do all of the different experiments and data collection to show what you're doing. And in and music, you kind of start by a riff and in, in a direction and you go in all sorts of places, but then you have to like figure out what's the chorus, what's the, you know, well, what's yeah, the right. what's the this? Yeah. You gotta lay down 64 tracks and figure yes. out where the ear candy is. So in the end, it's like it's a pro and you got to get the pitch just right. And so all right. of that is actually, you know, both creative and very rigorous. And so I think that they're similar. And I also find that in the times when I'm being most inspired w- uh, with my work or I, I'm doing kind of working the hardest. A lot of times like uh, songs will pop out and so I just think when your brain turns on it sort of can spit out other things and so I've often found that in the times like during this COVID pandemic I'm a COVID researcher but I've released a few songs it's just like you know what just happened and and sometimes those songs literally like in those other times those quiet times it takes me like a few months to come up with a song and then when I'm in the thick of it I'll literally like wake up and a song has just popped out so it's kind of like um so there's some good inspiration there somehow and, it, and it's mostly just the brain doing, uh, you know, something just getting yeah. that creative flow going just moves the whole thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, it's the magic of, and, and I mean, at some point we will understand what creativity is, but we, it's one of those beautiful kind of magical things that um, I, I really appreciate your point that in science there's that similar kind of, uh, you can do all the planning you want, but at some point innovation does come from some spark of creativity, that same magical place where something clicks for you and an idea comes together and then suddenly you have a new invention or innovation or you push science forward in some way. 
Um, so, you know, we're near the end of our time. I could talk to both of you forever, actually. This is a really fun conversation and uh, actually much more fun. I have conversations with people all day. It's my job, but I'm really enjoying this because uh, it, it doesn't feel like I'm trying to extract any information out of you. <laughs> Just seems like we're having a combo. So um, we're near the end of our time, but you know, I just want to give both of you a chance. If there's somebody who's in the place you were in, let's say 20 years ago, or however long ago it was in your career where you were unsure of yourself, where you were uncertain whether this was going to work out, whether you'd be in this place here where someone is asking you about the success you've had in your career, um, what would just a kind of the short message you would be you would give to that person who's in that place? Um, who's in, in their career and in their lives. M Mona, we'll, we'll start with you. I would say relax and don't think that far. <laughs> uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> I had no idea where I would be. And it's really the life, the circumstances, opportunities that uh, shape you and basically mm -hmm. show you the way forward. I don't know where I will be in 20 years from now. Uh, so, um, I don't know. I would just say, uh, enjoy and look at what you enjoy the most, what inspires mm -hmm. you most, uh, and pursue your passion. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to actually use a quote uh, from Mark Benioff that's not, that's not mine, but I think it's a good one. Um, and it's a, as a starting point, it's that people underestimate, uh, people, what is it? People overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in a decade. And people mm -hmm. get this feeling, I think in a year, I haven't done this, I'm, I'm a failure, right? But then like 10 years later, something has happened. And all of these things do happen by, by baby steps. You know, like if you're not here right now, it's okay. A lot of people who are the most successful people in the world didn't find their calling until they were 40. And I'm not saying wait until then, you know, always be part of that process, but it is about it's, you know, it, all it takes is that clicking into that right path. And that's what you should always be looking for. Keep your mind healthy, keep yourself around people who love and care about you, um, people you trust, um, you know, put yourself in that right place and then find your passion and it will click into gear. And I think just take every little bit. One of the things I've been in all these like really hard spots and you just realize one day it will pass. And so you, you have to kind of be in it when you're in it, but just keep pace yourself. It's a, it's a long journey and a lot can happen, um, you know, as the years pass by, as long as you're constantly finding your true north and finding where you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to be with. Uh, what, a, what a fantastic way to end. Uh, Paradis, Mona, thank you both so much for making time thank to you. speak with us. Uh, congratulations on all the success you've had in your career and being willing to be vulnerable here and share kind of your, uh, your histories and also all the thoughts you have. Uh, on your area of work. I'm going to hand it back over to um, Negar, who's going to wrap everything up, but I just want to personally thank both of you. I know many people who are on this call got a lot out of hearing from both of you. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much uh, to our esteemed panelists, Dr. Jarahi, uh, Dr. Sabeti, and Mr. Arab Louis. Uh, on behalf of Professor Mostofi and the Persian Studies Program, I want to thank everyone who joined us today and for your questions. Uh, just as a reminder, today's event was recorded and will be made available in the coming days on the Persian Studies uh, website. And uh, thank you so much again. Ruza khayli khubi dashta bashid. Khoda nagahda. Am hamintur, mirs. Khoda. Khoda nagahda. Khoda hafiz.